tried to get, as best I could, a plot of home prices in the United States from 1890 to the present. And uh, uh, you can see that we've had an enormous run-up in home prices and then an enormous collapse. That's 2006. Uh, and building costs don't explain it, population doesn't explain it, interest rates don't explain it. I think it's a bubble, okay? And I know jo I'm not convincing Jean Fama, but uh, uh, by the way, we're right now in Stockholm. Uh, we don't have a long time series for, for uh, Sweden, but we have for some nearby countries. Uh, Norway has, Norges Bank has a good home price index for Norway. And it shows a similar thing going up, except it's still going up. It didn't collapse like ours did. Uh, and I think this, something like that is happening in Sweden. Why are these things happening? That's, uh, that's something I don't, I think that we're learning more and we don't have answers yet. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that it is a bubble. So um, there's been another revolution in finance that we call the behavioral finance revolution. This is what uh, Gene Fama didn't get to in his talk. But, and I didn't, I'm not getting to it as much as I'd like either. It's been going on for 20 years now, so that economists are bringing in psychology, sociology, and other fields more. Let me just mention some really important things. In 1893, French sociologist Emile Durkheim came up with the concept of collective consciousness. What he was saying is that the way we think at any time in history depends on what other people are thinking. We, we think the same thoughts. Certain ideas re reverberate in our mind because we hear them all the time from other people. And then in 1925, Maurice Halbwachs, another uh, French sociologist, came up with the concept of the collective memory. What he said is that what you remember at any point of time depends on what you've heard other people say. You know, your mind forgets. Unless memories are reinforced, they just go away and you don't remember them. So you remember a set of facts that you've heard repeated many times. And when you try to evaluate things like the housing market, you are going to come to the same conclusions as everybody else because you don't remember some important facts. And you don't remember them because nobody's talking about them. I could tell you about the housing bubble in 1943 to 53 and use that as an example, but I bet hardly anyone here knows anything about it. If you could go back in a time machine, you could stop anyone on the street and they'd tell you about that bubble. But, but we, we forget and so we repeat mistakes from the past. Irving Janis was a social psychologist who in 1971 wrote a book called Groupthink. And it's about how expert groups make terrible mistakes. Uh, and they do so partly for these kinds of reasons, but partly because of people's uh, social tendencies. The tendency to self-censor, to not want to express opinions that deviate from the group opinion, uh, and so on. Selective attention was talked about by William James in his 1890 Principles of Psychology. He said that people pay attention to certain things, there are structures in our mind that help define what we pay attention to. One thing is that there's a social basis for attention. We tend to pay attention to the same things as everyone else. So we get reinforced in certain fallacious beliefs at one time or not another because you, you just naturally look at what other people are looking at. Uh, the equity premium puzzle, uh, which Prescott and Mara uh, pointed out, is an example of a, I think, kind of a selective attention phenomenon. In my book, um, Irrational Exuberance, I emphasize the news media as an important part of speculative bubbles that drives them. The news media amplify certain social epidemics. Uh, not, not, not maliciously, uh, but they're a business and they have to attract attention. So they tend to focus more attention on ideas that are already in the public attention. Uh, I think that in understanding speculative bubbles, we have to be eclectic. 
And I think that what people are doing right now in the field of population biology, in the medical school, the, the epidemiology departments, and what's going also on in medical schools in neuroeconomics, we're, not, we're learning more about the human brain. All of these research directions are changing the way we think about ourselves and economics can't stand in isolation and ignoring all of these things that are happening. There's a lot of, in, to understand complex phenomena, we have to take account of every different kind of human uh, uh, expertise. But this is my last slide. Now, I want to say, though, that I've just made this strong pitch for other social sciences and for a broad approach to understanding uh, uh, economic phenomena. On the other hand, I come back to Dean at the end and say, yes, I think efficient markets is, is a worthy theory as a crude approximation. We have to teach it to our students. And I teach Fermat and Hansen to my students because I believe that there is some truth to efficient markets. It, it's not perfect, but on what it also means is that our financial markets are useful. They're useful, although they crash at times and they do the wrong things. But we, we, we in fact, in the future, ought to expand the scope of our financial markets to, so that there'll be more pricing. And unfortunately, there'll be more bubbles and bursts, but that's part of an imperfect world. But I, I, I've argued, in, well, I have a book called Finance and the Good Society that came out last year. Uh, I, I think that we will be pricing more things, not just real estate, but there are things like longevity. The European Investment Bank tried to create a market for longevity, lifespan expectations. It hasn't taken yet, but that's the kind of thing that will happen because it's an important economic concept that there should be a market for it. And there should be markets that capitalize flows like GDP or energy prices or even occupational incomes. These ideas that might sound strange today will, with better computer technology and better understanding, uh, help, uh, help us uh, advance to a better civilization. So what I've done is presented imperfect evidence uh, along lines of my fellow Nobelists, but with a different emphasis uh, and with a conclusion that's maybe radically different about bubbles, <laughs> but not radically different about the general importance of our financial markets. <laughs> so, and I would like to invite all of the laureates uh, on stage. Um, and take the opportunity to give them uh, another break, uh, another big hand. Uh, thank you so much.